Psalm 34, 1 to 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. 
This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. And verse eight, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Father, we approach your throne tonight in the precious name of Jesus, your son, your son who came to redeem us from our low, low estate. We thank you, God, for your love. We are uh, products, evidence of your goodness. We are evidence of your mercy, evidence of your great grace towards your children. We praise you, God, for the work of your hands. Uh, before we were even formed, God, in our mother's wombs, you ordained us, you chose us, you called us, um, and you had a plan for us. You loved us so much that you adopted us into your family, adopted us and gave us a great inheritance gave us the gift of eternal life and untold riches in Jesus Christ. We thank you. We crown you now, God, as the author of all life. We stand in awe of your creation, God. Everything in this world reflects your great majesty because you are a great God and a great king in all the earth. We thank you, God, that your son is the savior of the entire world. We stand amazed by your grace, amazed by your goodness. We thank you for the peace that we find in forgiveness. We thank you for the rest that we find, God, um, in your presence. We thank you, God, for the hope that we get because of the healing that you provide for us. It is a privilege to be in your presence tonight. And we just pray, God, that every word that is acknowledged tonight brings you glory and honor to your great name. Again, we ask that you will uh, bless and keep your hand and cover and hover over on Networking for Christ ministry and those who are watching on Facebook and Zoom, that you will continue to bless and strengthen Bishop Grant and Sister Grant. God, we just tell you, thank you. We love you. We know that you love us, God, and we know that you are a good God. Because when we cry unto you, you hear us and save us out of all our troubles. Thank you, God, for being good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody. If you are on Facebook, good night. And if you are on Zoom, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we have been uh, studying since Sunday about the goodness of the Lord. Truly, God is good and greatly to be praised. And so the psalmist says tonight, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we are blessed to put our trust in him. If you did not catch the sermon from Sunday, you need to. I will remain. I don't know who else has been reciting it like a mantra this week. I will remain confident, super confident, mega confident. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so I've been looking out for it. Uh, pastor preached on Sunday about the manifestation of the goodness of the Lord. And so I've been declaring that. And I am telling you that every day I just see God just putting these little pieces together and just um, just as my faith continues to rise, he just continues to just be good. And so I'm so grateful. Um, if you didn't catch a uh, Bible study last night or the teaching from Monday, you should do that too. Um, and tonight is uh, Wednesday night, uh, Wealth Wednesdays, maybe financial coaching with Sister Jackie. Um, I don't know about you, but I have my little notebook here of just the times that um, Sister Jackie comes on and teaches. And so I uh, take my notes. So if you, if you missed last week or if you've missed any of them, you should start from the beginning. Sister Jackie has taught us how to make a budget. She's taught us how to evaluate our debt and our spending. She's given us tips on investing and little things that we can be doing um, and when to start and when not to start. She ties in how God um, intends for us to have wealth and create wealth and use the wealth to bring his name honor and glory and i'm telling you it's a lot but thank god facebook records everything for us so if you've missed it on wednesday nights just scroll back every wednesday for the next for the last couple of weeks and you'll get some of that teaching and so last week we sister jackie talked about spending habits and investing habits and she's going to come on again tonight and teach as the Lord leads concerning our finances. So Sister Jackie, welcome, welcome. Hi, Sister Carrie, thank you. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back. And, you know, um, it's really our faith, our trust, and our hope is in the God that we serve. Because the word tells us that it is he that gives us the power to get wealth. So even when we're talking about money, God is not excluded because when we as believers 
think about money, it's not about satisfying our needs, our personal needs and just what we want. But it's really to serve the bigger purpose, which is the purpose of God, the things for which he has called us to get done in this life. And so with that in mind, as you're talking about, we believe to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm just going to jump down to this second to last part of our declaration, because I believe God for 2020. And it says, this is my season to decree the supernatural establishment of what? God's will, not what I desire, not what I want, but God's will and purpose for my life, for my family, for my ministry, for my finances and my relationships. And I always add in it, my business. And the reason why we can take command of this and say my, because we have already established that it is in relation to God's will and purpose for our lives. And so when we're saying my, I'm taking ownership of what God has willed for my life and I'm decreeing it and declaring it. And so one of the will that we know that God has for our lives is that we prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prosper. And you'll notice the soul is not left out of it. So because the same Bible also tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil, the love of it. Nothing is wrong with being wealthy or having much or wanting to do well or become a millionaire for that matter. But if you love money above people, if you love money about, above honesty, if you love money about the things that really matter in life, then you're in trouble. And if God is not covering us, all that comes will go easily. So thank you again, Sister Carrie. I look forward to tonight. And as usual, I'm, I'm trying to keep these to like 30 minutes, you know, and be done. But, you know, sometimes I get a little carried away. But um, to God be the glory. Let's see what we're going to talk about tonight. So we're, we're going to talk about some money lessons tonight. Um, and because uh, last week we talked about how spending habits and our investing habits are really what is going to be the results at the end. It's how we spend what we have. It's how we invest what we have. So our spending habits are really, really critical. And so last week we talked about our Mr. Reed, Ronald Reed, the, 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 the gas station attendant turned uh, uh uh, janitor that died and left that eight million dollar net worth. And so last week I was really trying to open this up to us so we can see and really realize. Because in addition to that, because you know I didn't really see it mentioned there that he was a believer or anything. And so I look at this and I'm thinking, whoa, if this you know man who I, I didn't, I'm not saying that he wasn't, but I didn't hear anything or see anything about that in the story. But if he can do this on a janitor's salary, I am a child of God with the Holy Spirit as my helper, with the Holy Spirit as our helper, what more could we do? Because we have work to get done in the kingdom. So the three habits for becoming wealthy, which we talked about last week, was that I must have a plan for the money I earn before I receive it. And why is that important? Because if I don't have a plan for the money before I receive it, Something is going to come in and take that money before I have a plan. So we have to ensure that we have the plan before we have the money. Because usually also once we get the money, we don't feel like we need to plan anymore. So have the plan before we get the money. And number two, I must spend less than I earn. If we spend more than we earn, we are going to be in trouble. And as you will see tonight, as we talk about Mr. Reed last week, and then tonight we're going to talk about some other notables on the opposite end who really spent more, they, they amassed a lot, but they still spent a whole lot more than they amassed and it got them in trouble. Number three, I must invest ahead of inflation and for the long term. And we're gonna see again with these men, because it's all men I use there, they did not invest for the long term. All they were thinking about was short term. 
or they made bad investment decisions. So some of our investments, that's what we talk about, you know, it can't be, everything cannot be based on high interest yield because high interest yield usually means high risk as well. So if we have the old habits, we need to get the new habits. So the, the first gentleman we want to look at, and most of you, if you watch, um, I'm going to really deal with tonight mostly NFL and NBA players. And so if you have, even if you're not even an NFL or NBA fan, these names, they're often in the news, they're often around. So you've probably heard of them. Vince Young, $25.7 million. That was what he earned. Then we have Vin Baker. And for those of you who used to watch in that era, the Michael Jordan era, the Scottie Pippen era, that's when Vin Baker was around, $97 million. And most of you who watch, you must have known Warren Sapp, the guy who is always talking, $82 million. And Antoine Walker, $108 million. And everybody remembers this guy, the Conroe guys, Alan Iverson, $200 million. You know, fortunately for Iverson, he had a contract which had, you know, fortunately, whoever he was working on his behalf did a good thing where he got this, uh, this endorsement where he was going to be paid a certain amount over a number of years down the line or else all that would have been gone. And so as I bring these gentlemen up on the screen, what do they have in common? And as you see each of them, it's millions, millions. They had that in common, but they also had negative, negative habits in common as well. Look at these facts about money in sports. Sports is one of the career where you can really make, make a whole lot of money in a short space of time. Also, however, your career span is also shorter. So it's even more important, not really say more important, but that is why it's also important for you to have good spending habit and good investing habits because you're going to get a whole lot fast, but it's not going to be like that for years and years and years to come. So you're getting a lump sum and you're getting it quickly. So you must have a plan for it. So it doesn't really matter how much it is. We still need to have a plan. For us, we get a much smaller amount annually, but the same thing applies. We have to have a plan for it. Look at this. A six-year stint in the NFL translates to more money than the average college graduate will earn over their entire lifetime. So that means we know that the typical worker works for with between 30 and 40 years. So these guys make in six years what most people will not even earn in 30 to 40 years. The lowest paid player in the NFL right now, and this was last year, 2019, on a four-year contract is an average salary of $610,000. So this is what a rookie gets in the NFL. And so if we even translate that, divide that by four, that's over $100,000 per year. So that's a six-figure income. Maybe quite a number of people that's probably listening to me tonight probably don't make six-figure income. And so that's the lowest. So we're talking about these guys making real money. But one of the things we always stress and I've always stressed is not how much money you earn, it's how much you keep. A rookie in the NBA in 2019 makes a minimum of $893,310. So we can call that roughly a million dollars. A rookie. Most of us won't earn that by a sal salary if you're in the six figure 10 years and when you put taxes 20 years you know by the time they take out you know what they're supposed to get so it's really important for us to um to bear these in mind 
One, so when we really think about it, and I want us to think tonight, and the reason why I want us to think tonight is that I think sometimes in our mind and in our thought process, we assume that if we don't get a big win for, if I don't win the lottery, if, I, if somebody doesn't leave me a big chunk of money, I am not going to be able to become wealthy, but that is not true. The everyday millionaire that stays a millionaire, millionaire for years and years of, most of them, a higher percentage, 70 plus percentage of them are self-made. Most people who have it handed to them squander it. I mean, these guys work hard for their money. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not belittling or by any means think what they do, you know, Sunday after Sunday for these, you know, uh, 16, however weeks it is, it's an easy feat, but it's really a whole lot of money to get in a short span of time. And sometimes when that happens, we don't appreciate it. You would think of all that money, those numbers that I just roll off, a rookie, almost a million dollars a year, you would think, wow, one in six NFL players file for bankruptcy. Why is that? The very thing we we're talking about, no plan for the money before they got it. Because let's be reasonable. There's nobody really that's living on planet earth that really needs to survive, needs $1 million per year to survive. We don't. We don't need a million dollar. That works out to like even like $100,000 a month. We don't need that much to really survive and even have a good life. We don't really need that much. So why would somebody who gets all this abundance have to file for bankruptcy? Because they did not have a plan for their money before they got it. Bankruptcy in sports facts. We're, we're, we're beating on this because we're talking about money and we're talking about mindset and habits, habits or habits are what is really going to get us as we talk about last week, our habits are what's really going to get us to be millionaires or get us to be people who are broke. It's not about how much money we get, it's about how much we keep. According to Sports Illustrated, 78% of the NFL players who are retired for only two years file for bankruptcy. And after five years of retirement, 60% of NBA players suffer the same fate. What does that tell us? I want us to think tonight because sometimes our mindset is wrong. We think if it's if I get a lump sum that it's gonna, I'm gonna be okay. If I get a lump sum, I'm gonna be okay. If I get a lump sum, my worries are over. If I get a lump sum, it's gonna be good. No, if we do not have a plan for the money, if we get a lump sum, it's not going to be okay. It will go much faster than it came in. According to a study in the National Bureau of Economic Research as well, close to 16% of NFL players in the study that were drafted between 1996 and 2003 also filed for bankruptcy within just 12 years of retirement. So you have about 78% of the NFL in the first two years, two to five years, and then another 16% within 12 years. What does that tell you? 70, 80, 94% in the end. So just about 5% really stay above the grade. Why? Because no money management skills. Roughly 16% of retired football players end up bankrupt within 12 years of stepping off the field for the last time. And look at the money we're talking about that they get on an annual basis. So tonight we're gonna say, uh, last week we talked about how to become a millionaire, what are you willing to do? And we talked about the three keys that we should focus on. And so tonight we're gonna talk about the three habits for becoming poor. Do these three things and you will be broke, you will be poor. If we exhibit a lack of financial knowledge, we're going to be broke, we're going to be poor. Why is this important? It is important because if we don't understand money, 
two things are going to happen. Either we're going to just spend it frivolously, or even if we invest and we don't keep ahead of inflation, it doesn't help us. So if we, when we, when we do not have a plan for our money and we earn, we, we use it, we, we use it before we have a plan for it. So we do, we do not prepare, we do not plan. That's really showing that we are, we're exemplifying a lack of financial knowledge because just because money comes into our hand, just because money comes into our account, it will never stay just because it comes. It doesn't stay because it comes. It is going to go, but we have to decide where I am going to put it. Where am I gonna allow it to go? What am I going to do with it? And really to have a proper handle on that, you have to decide before it comes. Because when you decide, you will have to ensure you get it done because there will be a lot of other issues and circumstances that's competing for your plan. And so that is why it's important to have a robust plan. What do I mean by that? That's why, for those of you who were watching when I did the budget, that's why there was a line item for every conceivable thing that we do. Because if a light line item is missing and there is nothing in the, in the budget for that, then the plan that you have would not be a solid plan. And then you're always going to be competing issues for the money that you have planned for. So the plan must be solid. Number two, let's look at what Proverbs 21 verse five says. The plans, and this is why we need a plan, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. So if we look at the plans of the diligent leads surely to abundance. That's why we are saying when we make the plan for the money, we already have the plan. And in that budget, we have a line item to compete for every area of expense in our lives. So that way we can be rest assured that the money that we plan to do X will go to X. If the budget is deficient, we will have problems. So that's why the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance. The plan has to be robust. The plan has to be all encompassing. We can't just, I've seen, talk to people and say, oh, do you have a budget? And they say, oh yes, I have a budget. And I said, okay, let's take a look. And so many important things are missing. There is no line item for car insurance. There is no line item for petrol. You can't drive, so they just put um, car payment and insurance. Well, sometimes we spend as much money on petrol as we do with insurance. So you have to factor in, so you have to factor in the petrol. And even though we only pay that uh, road insurance that we pay to, to the government once per year, there needs to be a light item for that. Why is that, Sister Jackie? That's probably only 70 or $50, yes? Because if you leave out every 50 or $70, leaving out four 50 or $70 is 200 bucks. So we cannot leave anything out because that is how you're going to be able to work with the plan that we have. If we have a plan that leaves things out, then we're going to say, okay, uh, when we're done and we say, okay, we, we have $200 to invest. And so we put it in a vehicle to invest, uh, or we have this emergency fund over here then something is going to come up because it's going to come up and there was no provision for it. So then we have to go back and take the money from another line item. So that is why it's important. Next, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. And this is one of the part where we have issues. You know, we talk about the 80-10-10 the rule. And the first 10% is a sacred portion that goes to the Lord. The agreement that we have with the Lord, the, 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 the partnership, I put it, that we have is that, okay, I'm going to give you health, strength, ability, wisdom, understanding, knowledge to get wealth. And I'm asking of you that you give me 10% back and you take the next 90. And then Sister Jackie jumps in there and said, okay, from that 90, you're going to always, always, always put 10% aside for your older self, 10% for later. And then the next 80, 
we can spend now. And that 10% is minimum. So if when we do our 80, we have leftovers, we can throw more there. But when we are saying, as we look on all those guys who made all those millions, guaranteed when they had little, they were not faithful in it. They weren't spending it properly. So now that they got millions, they couldn't spend it properly either. And that's the same thing with us. If we are not trustworthy when we have small, and for those of us who say, oh, well, I would really like to do that, but I don't have much, or I'd really like to do that, but you know, I can't afford it. Or for some of us, especially, and I'm talking to believers now who say, you know, we are in partnership with the Lord. And somehow we allow the enemy to say to us, the first thing that gets caught every time is the tithe. First time, because God will understand. Sure, he will, because he's not going to kill you. But he's not, you're not going to be the one that he's going to pour out abundance on because you're always going to think something else is more important than his 10%. And that 10% is really to go towards the work that he's called us to do here. So let's look at the next one. What you don't know can hurt you. And that is one when we talk about, when we talk about the financial knowledge, lack of it, that can hurt you. When you look at those guys who earn millions, nobody was there. Nobody was there on that list that filed for bankruptcy that earned under double digit millions. 20 something million was the lease. Why were they hurt? Why did they have to file for bankruptcy? Because they did not understand how money works. Their financial um, understanding was limited. regardless of our net worth. And so we can look at this two ways. We must play an active part in managing our finances. We can't just work and spend. And this doesn't really matter where we fall, whether we are who we are now, which is the normal, regular human beings with average income, or we are professional athletes with multi-million dollars, Regardless of our network, we must play an active part. That is one of the issues those multimillionaires run into. They don't have the financial knowledge. And so some of them just give it over to these financial planners to tell them stuff. And they don't even know if what they're saying makes sense. And then they find out those investments weren't good or they themselves didn't really know anything. So we have to, it is our responsibility as children of God. Everything that God gives us financially now. I am not responsible for the money that God gives you and you are not responsible for the money that God gives me. I am accountable for that. You are accountable for what God gives you. And the Bible says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And if we go back to Psalm one, it says, it, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So if you don't get the knowledge from the Holy Spirit, you also, we have, we have uh, our fellow believers. We have people with knowledge and understanding that we can seek out. We're never going to know everything. We're never going to know everything. Even those of us who are in the financial industry, sometimes you have to go research stuff. You have to research the history on, on a particular investment to see, is it worth the risk? So we're never going to know everything, but it behooves us if we can read and write to read and to ask questions. And nowadays, even if you can't read, you don't even have any excuse. You just talk to the phone. It talks back to you. So we have to start actively managing our finances. That's the only way we're going to go from where we are to more wealthy. No one, no one is going to care about your hard earned money more than you do. I don't care what they tell you. No one is going to care about your hard earned money more than you do. And you know why I say that? If you're not paying these financial advisors, they're not doing it for free. They're not doing it for free. So they don't care about your hard earned money. As a matter of fact, when it's your money and you just give it to them and you're not asking questions, you're not watching over it, you're not managing, they'll do stuff with it that they probably won't try to do with their money because something is risky. They'll try it. 
not even the best of financial managers, you should just give your money and leave it. You should ask questions. When, when, the, when the statements come in on an annual basis, if you read it and you don't understand it and then you look it up and you still don't understand it, you call, the, call them up. It's their responsibility to explain it to you. And as children of God, we do not have any excuse because I really believe this with all my heart that the Holy Spirit is my helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. If we didn't need a helper in this life, Jesus wouldn't say, I'm going away. But when I go, I am going to send the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into all truth. If we didn't need him, he wouldn't be sent. And so he was sent. So even so, I really believe that as children of God, we have no excuse. So even when we hire a professional uh, financial advisor or, or a financial coach and we're working with them, our job is to really pray. Even when they say, okay, you know, uh, Sister Kerry, I think you should do X, Y, Z. You said, okay, this sound good. I'll take this and I'll get back to you. And you go talk to the Lord, say, Lord, uh, uh, John Brown says, this is the best way. Lord, should I do that? Because you see, as children of God, we have to know how to talk to him. We have to know when he's talking to us. That is wh why our relationship with the Lord is important. We can't leave him out of it. And that is what is some of our problems, really. We leave God out of the money part. We earn it and then we leave him out. And we say, okay, I have it. And we don't ask any questions anymore. When I'm doing investing, I invest, for those of you who know me, know I'm an investor. I'm a real estate investor. I invest in properties. But the reality is I never invest in a property unless I consult the Lord about it. And sometimes I crunch the numbers. It looks good. And I'm all excited about it. And, you know, I feel a little touch back in my spirit. And, you know, in the beginning, it was very discouraging. But no, I learned to totally trust him. So I don't worry about the numbers anymore. I still crunch my numbers because we are responsible. We cannot leave everything because, listen, the Holy Spirit is not a psychic. He knows everything, but his job is not to treat us as psychic. We are supposed to do our part, our due diligence. We're supposed to research. We're supposed to ask questions. And then when we have the answers and the options, we go to the Holy Spirit and we say, these are the options. What should I do, Lord? What should I do, Holy Spirit? Which of these are the best? Because the reality is even us as financial professionals, we do not know what the market is going to do in 10 years. But I can guarantee you, the Holy Spirit knows. He knows which way it's going to go. And so if we rely on him, if we trust in him, if we are partnering with him in what we do, we, it's a partnership. If we partner with him, he's never going to steer us wrong. The beauty of it is this, believers, it's never too late. It's never too late. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new day. Number two, three habits of becoming poor. Number two, what's number two? Overspend and have exaggerated buying habits. All of those guys that I just showed you earlier, those five guys, all of them overspent. Whether it was 100 million, 200 million, 23, 23 million, they overspent. And they had extravagant living habits, buying extravagant stuff, overspending. So if we do that, if we overspend, regardless of what the amount is, if we overspend, we're gonna be broke, we're gonna be poor. So we're back to our spend less than I earn, 80, 10, 10. If we, if we spend 80%, give our sacred portion to the Lord and invest 10% for the long term, we're not overspending. And that 10% that we're talking about, that I say from time to time, that is not for you to spend uh, next month and next year. That's for the long term. That 10% is for later on. Because in that 80%, and that's why I talk about when we create this budget, how really all encompassing it has to be. Because that 10% that we're talking about, it's like your 10% sacred portion. 
10% is a sacred portion that goes to the Lord. 10% is this, is that 10% that goes to your retired self. So 65 or older. So whatever money you need to spend now and before you're 65, that's in the 80%. So that's the bare minimum we're talking about. That 10% is not for, oh, I'm just going to spend it. Oh, save it to buy a car. No, that's not it. That, that car that you need to buy is in that 80%. And so I, I, I want us to really get that budget idea. And for those of you who would like to have one of those budgets, text us, email us, and we will send that to you. So you make sure that every line item is accounted for. This is what scripture says, Proverbs 21, 20. And I really, this is my favorite money scripture. A foolish man devours all he has. That's my favorite money scripture. And look at what Proverbs 17 and verse 16 says. <laughs> Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? Because one with money has the ability to purchase Every knowledge there is to learn about money. All of these guys has million, but they didn't do that. Why should a fool have money in his hand to buy wisdom when he has no sense? We have to use wisdom with what we have. We have to have a plan. We have to have a strategy and we have to execute it. If we spend more than we earn, we're going to be in the place of where all these millionaire guys were. No matter who you are, spending more than you make will eventually catch up with you. Do you think earning 108 million, and remember the statistics that I showed you guys, right? Most of them within two, five, or 12 years. So the spending habit determines if it was two years, five years or 12 years, and for that small, approximately 5%, why theirs didn't run out for them to file bankruptcy. So no matter, no matter what the amount is, as long as you spend more than is coming in, it's going to run out. Because you would say, okay, well, if I have, maybe if you or I have $23 million, which was the smallest amount we talk about tonight, Maybe we would never go bankrupt because, well, some of us, <laughs> you would hope, but some of us, because then if you look on the other statistics about lottery winners, most of them go back to broke within, I think it's five years. So it comes, comes back again. And this is why it's really so important for us to develop these really good spending and investing habits because that will determine whatever comes in our hand, what happens to it. So it's not really how much money that comes in our hand. The, you know, these people that go around and buy lottery ticket, they really believe with all their heart. If I win the lottery, my life's going to be okay. It's going to be good. But no, it won't be because you don't have a plan for the money. So before you turn around two, five, ten years later, it's all gone. And the sad thing about it is, you know, when you read these things, it's so sad. Even when I read about all of these millionaire guys, it's so sad because I said they had all these so-called financial advisors and nobody said, you know what? You're getting all this money. We're going to buy this house for X amount, a million dollars, and we're going to buy it cash. So even when you go broke, you have somewhere to live. I mean, one of those guys on there, Vin, Vin Baker, I think it was, he had to end up taking a job at Starbucks. Not saying anything wrong with working at Starbucks, but I'm saying from millionaire, 98 million to Starbucks to keep afloat. Meanwhile, all he had to do was have some financial knowledge for himself, had a plan for his money and keep an eye on it don't just give it to people to invest for you and trust that they're going to do the right thing. No, ask about it. I need to see the statement. Okay, what's this going to do? And follow it up. You can't be so busy 
You can't be so busy. You don't have any time to steward the, 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 the funds that God has given us. That's why some of us is not going to get any more because they were obviously too busy doing what? I don't know. To be steward over your own money. I don't know. You know, back in the days when I used to watch Oprah, I know, you know, with technology and everything now, I don't know how she does. I remember her saying, this was like 20 years ago, that she writes every check. She signs every check. Somebody writes them, but she signs every check that came out of her account. You can't be too busy to be steward over your own blessing that the Lord has given unto you. So we have to be responsible because remember, we just saw the scripture earlier. If you're faithful in a little, God will, will give us much. But if we have a little now and we're not paying any attention, we're not faithful, God is not going to be, let's just look at it. As it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. If you have a child that is not diligent, that doesn't take care of anything that you give to them, are you inclined to just give them more, give them more? No. And so as it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. If we're not being good stewards of what God has already blessed us with, we're going to have a hard time receiving much more. And when we are getting teaching, we have to apply these teaching to our lives. Don't just listen. And, and, and the truth about it is, you know how it's been said, right? To whom much is given, much is required. And so once you hear, once you hear, and everybody's going to hear something different. But whatever we hear and it hits our spirit, that is our indication that that is a change I need to make. That is a strategy I need to employ because a lot of words, thousands of words are spoken in a 30 minute time frame. Everybody's going to hear something different. A different piece is going to come out to each person differently. Whatever comes out to you, that is your part that you need to do. That is your part that you need to fix. That is your part that you need to employ. This is what I'm not doing. I need to do this part because I guarantee you somebody else who is listening didn't even hear that. And so that is how when we're in partnership with the Holy Spirit, he'll allow us to hear and even hear it deep. You hear it in your spirit. You hear it, you understand it and it just comes, oh, wow, this is what I need to touch. This is what I need to do. This is what I need to move. And so, three habits of becoming poor, number three. And we're listening to this to say, okay, well, if I don't want to become poor, then I have to go back to next week. If I want to become a millionaire instead, then I have to go back to next week and employ those. But if I do these, in other words, what this means is if these are what we're doing, we're going to be poor, remain poor. If we make poor investment decisions or don't invest any at all, because not investing is making a poor investment decision as well. And the opposite of that is I must invest ahead of inflation and for the long term. Investing is not, investing is not gambling. Gambling is what you, you put it, you know, when I was young, I used to watch the men do over and under. And they just open the cardboard, they do the card, you put down your money, they put their thing. If, if their card wins, they, everybody they just pick up all the money and you're gone. That's not what investing is. That's gambling. Any times there is a big return, short space of time, you know the saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good. And some of us have this... I don't even know what to call it, uh, this innate ability to always be drawn to the thing that sounds good, that, that investment thing that, oh, that sounds so good. Oh, oh, oh in, in five years, oh, I can be a millionaire. No, everybody would be a millionaire if it only took five years. It's not hard to do anything for five years. So I must invest ahead of inflation and for the long term. And usually what that means is long term means you're certainly going to get gain, but it's not going to be quick and fast. But some of that must be in the portfolio. 
So we have to invest ahead of inflation. And, and for some of us, you know, we're so afraid to invest or to think, wow, it's going to take a long time. And so we keep it in the bank and it's falling below inflation. So remember what we teach, right? You keep your six month emergency fund in the bank because you wanna have it quick and in a hurry. Your 10% that you're supposed to invest, we need to invest that in long-term investment. This is what Proverbs 13 and verse 11 says, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. See what I just said about, I'm not making this up, it's scripture, see it there, it's there. But as you start to do things in the natural, you will see that there's a word of, the word of the Lord is for every area of our lives. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle. So when we're trying to make a quick buck, quick and fast, want big returns, quickly, wealth gain hastily will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about investing for the long term. What that means is you're not going to get a big gain, but you're guaranteed a minimum interest a minimum interest, that means you can get more, but you're not gonna get less than X amount. So that tells you, okay, I will be keeping pace with inflation. So you always want that minimum guaranteed amount that tells you I'm not going to be losing my value in my money because I'm keeping pace with inflation and then I have the opportunity to increase above that. And if I do it long enough, I am going to win. It's proven, it's there. Without counsel, Proverbs 15, 22 says, without counsel, plan fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. And so we don't just wanna just, um, and, and I will, I will forever say this, the best counsel you can get is from the Holy Spirit. Do not, so no matter how many advisors we have or how many people we're gonna ask their opinion or you know their professional uh, uh, opinion or whatever it is, we must, if you have three advisors, the Holy Spirit need to be the one you consult before you sign on the dotted line. The Holy Spirit must be our counsel. He must be the number one person on the advisory board. So no matter what the financial advisor say, or even what your flesh says, because sometimes your flesh thinks, oh man, this is good. I can't see anything wrong with it. Check with the Holy Spirit. If you get that pushback in your spirit, if you get that check, whatever you call it, I don't know how, the Lord speaks to you. I don't know how your partnership with the Holy Spirit works. You have to know that it's an individual way that the Lord speaks to us. But if what I can tell you is that if we leave him out of the equation, our success is not guaranteed. But I am 100% confident if Jesus said he's going to send him <laughs> because we need him, we need him. And we don't just need him. One of the problem is with us, like, okay, if we're sick or if we're certain things, we think, okay, yeah, well, I need to consult the Lord on this. I need to get advice on from the past on this for the spiritual matter. We need to get counsel from the Holy Spirit on financial matters. God is our partnership in this. Remember, we are his. We're here working for him unless we're not in the partnership. So he cares about every aspect of our lives. He's the one that has the total plan for our lives. Remember what we were talking about tonight. And so if he knows and he has the plan, he knows what's gonna happen. You think uh, COVID-19 took the Lord by surprise? No, it didn't. So he knew that in 2019, COVID-19 was gonna be here. I'm sure he saved some of us from some investment mistakes that we would have made because of that. 
but do we do we do we include him in everything or is this just this is just mine and my financial advisors uh uh meeting no we have to be in partnership with the lord in every area of our lives that is how our success is going to be completed or be assured so in wrapping up what what do we learn tonight that becoming a millionaire does not mean we will stay that way if we have the wrong spending and investing habits and those five guys that we picked out they're just we talk about 90 something percent so we wouldn't have time or page to list them so we really have to have our spending and investment habits wrapped up, locked up. We have to have those or else we become a millionaire suddenly or over time. And I've hardly seen, you know, most of the time, the self-made millionaires usually stay millionaires. And I believe, I personally believe the reason for that is as we're talking about spending and investing habit, because remember, habits after a while, it just becomes a part of you. So when you develop good spending habits, good investing, it just becomes a part of you. Somebody can't just come up to you and says, listen, good investors and uh, with good spending habit and invested habit, right? So you invest $200,000. They know, okay, that is coming to maturity in december they already figured out what they're going to do with that what the next investment is going to be they don't wait until it so it goes really from what if it's going to be investing it goes from one investing to the next because time is money and so even though they may not have to be watching their paycheck that sit in their bank account they're watching their investments and thinking okay i'm getting that on the 15th of december um what am i gonna do with it the research is already done okay we're gonna put it over here so we are, we, we we have to have spending and investing habits every day that the money sits in the bank we lose investors don't do that they have a plan before that investment matures exactly what they're going to do with it and so we have to have that develop that habit for our lives that no if i earn 200 dollars a week or there's a bi-weekly i get four or monthly i get 800 i am gonna know exactly what i'm doing with that before i get it so let us endeavor that we are going to work on our spending and investing habits all right that's it for me tonight so it's all about money lessons are about habits 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 spending habits investing habits and after we do after we develop really those good spending habits those good investing habits it just becomes easy it becomes easy thank you sister carrie this was awesome as usual so informative um something you were saying earlier about with tithing and giving god the, the 10 percent our sacred portion and i was thinking that um you talked about the thing that's sometimes hard for christians the the, the first thing that gets cut is mm -hmm. you the tithe and the offering mm -hmm. and i was thinking that if we can't live on the 90 percent or the 80 percent then more than likely the 10 percent is not going to make that much of a difference either okay okay and then we're robbing See, on top of it right and so that's really sister carrie it's really a device of the enemy that we buy into weeks ago before when we we're talking about remember pastor was teaching about the snares of the enemy that's one of the snares because he knows that when we don't do that then the windows of heaven are not open for blessings to pour out on us so he's ensnare us to think that okay the 80 can't do and the 90 won't do but if you take the 10 it's gonna be okay and it's not because it's the lesser of the 
of the amount anyway. So it's a snare of the enemy. It's a trap of the enemy. And we fall into it so easy because like he said, like he said to Eve, did God really say to us these days? He said, God will understand. God see and know. <laughs> and so because we because we know that God is a loving God, God is a merciful God, we say, yeah, God will understand. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then I was um, thinking along with the tithing as well that um, so then this idea of giving sacrificially and giving to God, right, giving or giving God the sacred portion. And then I thought, if it is hard for us, I think you and I've had this conversation before, too. If it is hard that if you got that lump sum of like a 10,000 and you find it hard to cut a check for a thousand dollars for sacred portion, like how, how? when God increase and blesses you with, you know, um, a million. A million to write a check dollars, right? It's going to be painful um, for you to do that. You probably won't be able to do it well. So this is why habits like little, you know, taking care of the little by little and doing what is um, expected of us with the little. So that way, when the big or the increase comes, it's, it's just clockwork. You just keep going because it's what you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome so good and the bible being so complete that it has an answer for everything like these scriptures everything. are coming alive these last couple of wednesdays like whoa that's in there too mm -hmm. yeah yeah and some of them you read them you're like ouch like that hurts like the one about why do i give why give money to a fool yeah. oh mm -hmm. because to buy wisdom because he has no sense i was like ouch that's that's, sense. that hurts that hurts but it's amazing but we commit our ways to God, yes. then it's the desire of our heart. If we commit our money to God, then he yes. promises also to give us the desire of what he wants us to do with it. So I just think that's incredible. And think about this, Sister Carrie, right? We're in partnership with the Lord, right? He's given us his son. He's given us his all. And he's turned around and blessed us uh, so we can do what we do. And yet... We can't even commit his 10% to him. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's like if we go in a partnership in the natural and we said, okay, we're going to go in business and it's going to be 50-50, you best believe I want my 50. You ain't getting in 60 and I get 40. It's 50-50. And so if you have a partner who every time, that's what the contract says, that's what the deal says, you know, and then every time the money comes in, he wants 60 and he wants to give you 40. We wouldn't want to put up with that. And then you're thinking, oh yeah, this other venture, this other business venture is over here. I'm going to do another business venture. No, you're thinking, no, I'm not doing it with him again. Cause every time we get paid, he robbed me. So I'm going to go over here to this guy that I have this other business venture with. And there is there it's, it's in there. It says, if you're dishonest with little, right. You're going to be dishonest with much. But somehow people think that we think that if we're dishonest with little, somehow automatically when there is much, we're going to be honest with it. Mm -hmm. When we have little, we don't want to give or we can't give and we don't want to give. But then when we have much, somehow we think that automatically we're going to want to give it. No, everything is habit. And sometimes when I remember when I was a new believer, uh, that 10% thing didn't sit well at all. Because I used to see it how probably even sadly some believers see it today. Like, I'm not going to give this pastor my money. I'm not going to give no man my money because then, and then we say, because God don't need money. You know, we say those things. And thankfully for me, this is, you know, what I love about the God that we serve. He knows our heart. And so when your intent or your you say something out of ignorance, out of what you really believe, but it's against the word of God. I tell you, the Holy Spirit will just tap you. And I was, I was in my church in Ottawa one day. And this is when I was divvying up the 10%, how I want to divvy it up and give it where I want to give it. And I'm sitting in there and the Lord just came and spoke to me and said, that's not for you to give. And, and the thing about when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's clear. He doesn't even have to use like a lot of words like I'm using now. He says, that's not yours to do that. And you get it. 
And so, Sister Kerry, even as you say that, we're going to take a minute and, and we're going to pray. Father, you are the God of all God and the King of all kings. And specifically, God, tonight, I want to pray for those of your children who are listening this teaching and who are hearing. And Father, they're struggling with the 10% that is the sacred portion. They struggle. Because, Lord God, in their minds, they know, they read it, they hear it, and they kind of believe it. But somehow, Lord, the enemy has captivated them, and they give it grudgingly. And there is scripture that declares that you love a cheerful giver. And sometimes, God, when we give the 10% and we give it grudgingly, oh God, it's not to our benefit. Because the word tells us that you love a cheerful giver. So tonight, God, the one request I have, sovereign God, is that for every hearer tonight that struggles with your sacred portion, may you, the Holy Spirit, who guides us into all truth, will deal with them, oh God, where they're at. Because you're the one, oh God, that knows the heart intent. And because you see it, oh God, and you know, and some people, oh God, are doing it not out of viciousness, oh God, not out of malice, but just out of ignorance, sovereign God, or lack. <clears throat> of understanding. But tonight, I pray, God, that you will touch their hearts. You will speak to them so that the abundance, oh God, that you want to pour out in their lives, the much that you want, oh God, to usher their way will be able to come their way because, Lord God, they're proven faithful in little. Father, I ask this in no other name than in the precious name of your son, Jesus, who died to save us from the snares of the enemy. Father, we thank you and we praise you tonight in your holy name. Amen. 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 God is good. All right. Well, thank God again for another night of, of of yes. and learning and and now as you said before it's whatever has stuck out to us tonight mm -hmm. it's for us it's for yes. you um yes. it's the last hour a lot like you said a lot has been said and mm -hmm. um, whatever is ringing in your ear it's what the lord wants you to yes yes <laughs> yes and as always thank you sister jackie i know that you're available for it's my pleasure. Uh, questions and and tips and tricks and strategy and so everyone can reach out to you um, I know it's 954-534-6392. So reach out to Sister Jackie if you have questions, get that budget sheet um, and all those other links to those videos that she has available so that we can learn about changing these bad habits into these healthy, wealthy habits that God yes. wants to establish. 2020 is still our year of establishment. We got what, six weeks left? Six, six weeks left and he's weeks. well able. Yes, he is. And pastor says, even if it's at 11.59 on 11 day, I was so low. And I said, nope, even if it's 11.59 on December 31st, God promised establishment. And so um, he God promised it and he will do it. And yes. as you say that, Sister Kerry, what, as you say that about if it's even 11.59, remember, there's a scripture that always jumps out at me is um, when there was famine in the land. And there was no food and everybody was going crazy and eating their children and eating, you know, animal head and, you know, and the Lord sent the word to say tomorrow this time. And so when we think about that, you see, when we read the scripture, right, we often take issue with those that were being spoken to and say, no, I didn't believe I didn't believe what? Okay. 2020 is our year of establishment and unparalleled success. When God said that tomorrow, this time, yes. in, there was famine. Yes. So we have to understand why the people would say, even the, what, did, what, 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 what did the man say? Even if God reigned it from heaven, that's how destitute the situation is. So those scriptures has to give us hope that even if it's 11.59 p.m. on December 31st, God is well able. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. And as you've been teaching for the last several weeks, it's not too late to um, have some establishment where our finances are concerned. We have to put the work in. We have to do mm -hmm. it. 
it's not going to fall from the sky. And so we need to, we need to partner with God, partner with the Holy Spirit. And like, if we need it, reach out, get that counsel that we need. Sister Jackie's yes. available and um, she'll help you get it together. Cut some stuff. So Jackie always telling us to cut stuff, cut stuff. Cut stuff, cut yes. Stuff in order to, 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 to. And we'll bandage it up after if we have to, but we got to cut them. <laughs> Oh dear, Sharice and I are always like, oh, there goes Sister Jackie, tell us to cut stuff again. Yeah, it works, it works. It does work, it does work. Um, all right, well, thank God for you. Thank God for everyone who's um, watching Facebook, Zoom, continue to pray for pastor, continue to pray for the ministry. Remember that on Sunday, it's um, Thanksgiving out on the field. We are taking the Operation Go bus out to Miami. If you haven't already spoken to Sister Mona about how you can contribute, or Sister Jackie, I know you have some information too, I believe, how we can contribute, what we can give, what time you're supposed to show up, anything you need to know, please reach out so that you can get information. Anything that you could add, maybe Sister Jackie on the- um... Um, uh, uh, Tomorrow we'll have Sister Maxine send out the exact time. I think it's around 11.30 that um, we're gonna be leaving. But I will have Sister Maxine send out, um, I'll finalize that time with um, Sister Mona and we'll send that out. And we need volunteers. We need volunteers. That's the most important thing. We need volunteers and we need the youth to come out and they will get credit for them coming out. They will get that for their um, community service. Community service uh, hours. Yeah. Perfect. Good, good, good. All right. With that being said, we're going to dismiss um, tomorrow evening. Bishop will come with a word um and uh friday and then we'll meet again on sunday the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the lord our god who is well able may he lift up his awesome countenance upon you and may he bless you with his peace amen Amen. This week we are manifesting the goodness of God. And Bishop said earlier, I think it was Monday night, Bishop Grant said that we should take this week and be the expressed like image, like the direct representative of the goodness of God. Find someone to be good to. Find someone to uh, to um, be the goodness of the Lord in their lives. So someone can can see that. Wow, I've tasted and seen. I, I've I've witnessed. I I got a I got a touch from the hands and feet of Jesus here on earth through one of His servants. Be that one this week. We're it's Wednesday. You still have a few days left. God bless you. Can't wait to hear the testimonies and uh, the growth. God is good. Sister LaBelle, God bless you. It's good to see you. I see you on Zoom. All right, everyone, have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Bless you. <laughs>